Sixty years ago, literally no one drank coffee in Japan. Okay, maybe a few did, but Japan wasn't really a coffee drinking country. Now fast forward to today, Japan is one of the 10 biggest consumers of coffee and that whole shift happened thanks to one guy, Clotaire Rapaye. Rapaye engineered one of the biggest and most successful marketing campaigns in human history. It was so successful that it literally created a multi-billion dollar industry out of thin air. And in this video, we are going to explore exactly how he made that happen. Now, let's take this back to the 1950s. Japan was solely a tea drinking nation. This was majorly highlighted by the 1952 hit, The Flavor of Green Tea Over Rice. Besides it being controversial, the most interesting perspective of the film is actually the title. The comforting taste and flavor of green tea poured over rice was and is a Japanese all-time favorite. For most of you out here, such a flavor would be completely out of imagination and experience, let alone provide any comfort or solace, thereby opening a window for the topic of acquired tastes. When we talk about tea versus coffee, it all comes down to personal preference. And this was Nestle's window into converting Japan. Like all successful accomplishments, it took Nestle more than one try to win Japan. They initially brought coffee into the country post-World War II in the hopes of exploiting the new market. But unfortunately, coffee just didn't go into the mainstream. And no matter how many advertisements or promotions Nestle launched, it just stayed on the shelf. Now, the thing was that Nestle had perfected its product over the years, from impeccable taste to great packaging, all topped up with affordable pricing. By all means, coffee should have taken the Japanese market. So why didn't it? To answer this mystery, they invited the famous French psychoanalyst Clotaire Rapaille to Japan in 1975. Well known for his research on the emotional bonds humans form with objects in their culture, he was the perfect solution. To start, Rapaille assembled large groups of Japanese people and asked them to participate in some stimulus experiments where he played soothing music and got them to talk back through their earliest childhood memories. After which, he asked them to describe their experiences with different products and the emotions they associated with them. This allowed him to pinpoint exactly what made certain products more favorable than others. Towards the end, he then asked them about their experiences with coffee but he got no response. Most had no memories of coffee. In fact, they'd never tasted coffee. That was it. This discovery would drive Nestle into making one of the boldest marketing moves of the 20th century. Once Rapaye put the pieces together, he went back to Nestle and said, please don't throw endless advertising dollars at converting the Japanese public to coffee. Your problem is much deeper. This isn't a problem of awareness, but emotion. He instead advised for a long-term strategy. He asked Nestle to focus on coffee-flavored candies and market them to focus on Japanese children. This would get the children to love Nestle's coffee flavor from an early age, building an imprint of happiness in their minds and memories. Taking over Japan with candy was right up Nestle's sleeve. After all, they were a global leader in not only coffee, but also chocolate. So they flooded Japan with their coffee-flavored goodies, which immediately became extremely popular with the Japanese youth. They loved them. And by extension of curiosity, so did the parents. They started simple, with a dessert. Of course, there were already desserts, like the well-known coffee jelly, that dominated Japan in the early 20th century. But Nestle aimed their desserts at the children of Japan. From there, 
they slowly moved to release other coffee flavored candies. Now, I'm not sure what exactly they were, but I'm sure it wasn't anything less than today's infamous Kit Kat bars. While currently Japan's Kit Kat market is off the charts, intricate and popular, the Japanese flavors didn't really emerge until the 2000s. So it's more likely that Espresso and Cafe Ole Kit Kats popped up around this time. Still, while they may not have been Kit Kats, Nestle's coffee flavored chocolates made a difference. After 10 years, Nestle was able to re enter Japan with a new wave of coffee offerings. Many of their candy customers were now of working age. They were already consumers of caffeine and long work hours, so Nestle was easily and successfully able to release their instant baristas, perfect for making a quick cup of coffee. By 2014, the coffee market was hitting record highs in Japan, according to the Japan Times. And by the time coffee flavored Kit Kats were introduced, consumers were well acquainted with the drink and flavor. This added another country to the coffee empire. Today, Nestle is the undisputed market leader in that geography. Japan is one of the largest consumers of coffee in the world, importing over 500,000 tons of it annually. Can you believe that? Nestle takes the crown for commitment. They stayed, waited, and dominated a tea drinking nation with coffee. This wasn't the only successful project of Rapaye, but it was, however, his first. Before this, he was a child psychiatrist that worked with autistic children, children that didn't speak, trying to find a cure with no results. Fortunately, after speaking at a university lecture, he was approached with Nestle's problem to convert Japan. After experiencing success and results at that level, he was amazed. He left psychiatry and started on his path of positive results. In fact, his career is filled with countless victories, helping companies take over one market after the other. It's what he's known for. Another one of his popular projects is with Chrysler and their design for the PT Cruiser. One look at the model and you know it's a bit out of the ordinary. But it wasn't always like this. The original 30s gangster look gives a don't mess with me message, so buyers feel safe. And even though people fell for the design, little to none actually bought the car. This is where Rapaye and his archetype research came to play. Like with Nestle, he conducted a series of three hour long group researches to help find the emotional response or reptilian hot button as referred to by Repaille. And to quote, that is the key to designing and marketing the product. In the first part of the groups, Rapaye asked the participants to pretend that he was from another planet and didn't know what automobiles, such as the PD Cruiser prototype, parked in the room were used for and to explain its concept. In the second part, they constructed collages of words they felt described the PT Cruiser. For the third hour, the lights were dimmed and participants were put into a waking dream state and asked to think back to their childhoods and record any memories that the prototype of the PT Cruiser brought to mind. A very similar process to Nestle's, but this time Rapaye found issues of safety and security. Participants spoke of a dangerous outside world, a jungle from which they needed protection. As a result, fenders were made more bulbous to appear more protective, the hatchback window was made smaller to increase safety and security, and the windshield was made more upright to give the vehicle a truck-like look. This paired with an equally safe and stylish interior, a response from future research groups by Rapaye, 
Chrysler was able to design a had-to-have car. The model resonates with people on an unconscious level. It was compelling and ideal. And as a result, the PT Cruiser sold like hotcakes. To tell you the truth, I'm truly amazed. How does one man come up with such connections? Connections that dictate not only people's responses, but a whole nation's? To have a mind like that. I hope you enjoyed today's video on one man's genius brain and now I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm so more people can see our videos and so that you can be notified when we launch our next video. We try and put out at least one new one per week and as you can imagine, the research and editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could also check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. We produce over 12 videos per month, so that is literally 8 cents per video. Thank you so much and we'll see you at our next unmasking.